Hello and welcome to the As Yet Unnamed podcast. I am Ian Barstow. In today's episode, we speak to former Mr. Gay UK and Mr. Gay World, Stuart Hatton. We talk about the process of being Mr. Gay UK and Mr. Gay World, very, very funny. And we also talk about what he is doing now, including his really inspirational So What campaign. Uh, As well as that, we talk Star Trek, Come Dine With Me, his current work, his dancing, his love of ballroom dance, lots of things going on uh, in this episode of The Podcast. If you're listening to us on one of the podcast apps, then why not click on subscribe and follow so you get the episode every time we release a new one. And if you're watching this on YouTube, click on subscribe, like, share, comment and click on the bell to get notifications when a new video is released. So without further ado, let's get into it. This is Stuart Hatton on the As Yet Unnamed podcast. Just a free walk. I might have a boyfriend walk through to come for his dinner sometime between seven and eight. <laughs> That's, That's fine. <laughs> so, hello, welcome to the As Yet Unnamed podcast. I am Ian Barstow, and in today's episode, we are joined by um, former Mr. Gay UK winner, um, dancer, um, teacher, and lots of other stuff that we'll get to discover as we go through this episode. Um, Mr. Stuart Hatton, good afternoon or good evening, actually, as we are. Good afternoon and good evening. Let's just go with both of them, because that was a brilliant way to greet someone, isn't it? Give all the greetings. Hello. It is, definitely. Um, So we are recording this on uh, the 29th of June. Um, It's probably going to go out in about a month's time or so. Um, So we are at, we're coming out of lockdown slowly after the coronavirus. um, And I've as I've asked everybody that I've interviewed during this time, um, how has lockdown been for you? Oh my goodness. I think everyone's had completely different experiences with lockdown, haven't they? Yes. I think for me, because I'm a people person, I see people on a daily basis. You know, I, I, I am a teacher. I do broadcast. I see people. People are just mint. <laughs> and then to not <laughs> see people was like, what's going on? But luckily for me, um, I've got a library of books that I needed to get through, and I've got through them. I even picked up books that I was meant to read at university, which I did for my dissertation and only read like a third through. (laughs) (laughs) I'm actually going to pick up these books and read them, and I did, and I feel like I've like come full circle in life. I'm currently reading, actually, about the moment. I'm going through American Gods, Neil Gaiman's American Gods, and it's quite cool. I'm enjoying it. That's been adapted by Amazon? Yes, this is on Amazon at the moment, but I'm not. I've got to read the book. I can't just jump in and watch the television series. I've got to get it in my brain. And if you get a good book, like a really good book, it's like you've been on a holiday. So I know we can't leave the country at the moment, but I feel like I'm in America right now. So that's a, it's a bit of a cheap holiday for me. Well, I read. I made the mistake. Um, I don't know if you've ever read. Well, actually, I listened to the audio book of um, Ready Player One, which got it. Have it's you got it? Cool. The book. It's absolutely fantastic. I loved every single minute of it, listening mm-hmm. to it. And then about a day later, I watched the film. I oh, know. And oh, my God. It is the most disappointing thing in the world because oh, no. the characters are different. Uh-huh. The actual stuff inside. So for anyone that's not uh, read it or listened to it, it's basically set in a universe where people go into this virtual world which is probably what's going to happen in about 20 years. Yeah. Um, and they have to, they have this competition and they have to play old video games to win prizes, to win this ultimate prize. Don't um, spoil it for me because I'm ready. No, no, it, but... not, not going to spoil it. But in the book, they are literally playing really old computer games. It's very nerdy, very geeky. In the film, completely different. And the characters are in the wrong place and they're not the right characters. And they're, they're, it's uh-huh. just, it was the most disappointing thing I've ever watched because I'd literally just finished the book I like so much. How very dare they do that to your brain. I know. How it's just not that. right. Um, and I thought I watched them. Um, I don't know if you watch Normal People. Um, it's, it's there. I've got my list. It's on my list. Is it on your list? 
It's fabulous. Oh, I, I, I've never read the book and I loved the series. I thought the series was, was just brilliant. The, the main actor was the main bloke in it was also a good eye candy. But anyway, let's buy them. Bye. Um, okay. <laughs> but I, I put on Facebook, I said, is it worth reading the book? And people actually said, no, the, the book is not as good as a TV series. It's one of those very rare things. Oh, I've, I've heard that about The Handmaid's Tale. Now, I read The Handmaid's Tale years ago and people were raving about the series. And I went on to watch the television series. I thought, I can't get into this. I need to go back to the book. So I picked up the book, which we read in school. We read that in school. <laughs> the Handmaid's Tale, what? Well, I went to a Catholic school. What were they doing to us? I picked it up again and read the book. Ah, oh, it's amazing. It's a brilliant book. Then I went back to watch the television series and it was just as good. So I thought, okay, I'm into this now. But I think you've got to read the book before you see the movie. Definitely. It is. It's, 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 yeah, it's, I don't read a lot of books, but some of the ones, some of the James Patterson books I've read and then you watch the film, they're nothing like it. And, and I keep watching them and thinking, well, that's not the character. Or you, <laughs> or you get them built up in your head and you've got this image of who this person mm-hmm. is and then you see the, the character, the actor they've put for it and you think, no. Like, no, that didn't work in my brain. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't what I thought about when I was reading this. Um, <laughs> so um, we've got lockdown. We're, we're, we're going through that. We are also currently in, um, coming towards the end of Pride Month. Um, and obviously mm. a lot of pride around the UK and around the world has been put back, scaled down um, yeah. because of because of COVID. Um, and obviously Pride is, uh, my first Pride was, I went to Blackpool Pride. Um, I was quite late going and Classy. going to prize. Oh God, yeah. Oh, um, I love Blackpool and um, Stella Artois um, at the. Uh, oh, I'm going to say the flying handbag, but it's not. It's the other one. Um, but yeah, I, that was my first pride, and it was such a a joyous experience. It was so much fun. Um, lots of drinking, lots of laughs, lots of good music, lots of drag queens, which I adore. Um, and then we sort of. But obviously, the last couple of years, we've been having issues with people saying, well, what about straight pride? All that sort of oh, no. rap and rubbish. Okay. Um, so what was your... Um... Every day, isn't it? Straight pride? Yeah. It's 65 days of the year. Yes. 366 upon a leap year. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we get one weekend a year. You get every year, don't you? Every yeah. day, every year, you get straight pride. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's... It's very, it's very strange. So obviously, um, you are uh, you are Mr. Gay UK. Um, you are a a gay man. You've got boyfriend. Did you say you're living with at the moment? Yes, yes, and he's just walked through right now. <laughs> <laughs> if he comes through for his dinner, now's the time to do it. <laughs> how long have you um? How long have you two been together? Oh gosh, um, we have debates over this. Um, we've been together for seven years. But we did have um, a year off, which we don't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> we did have a year off, uh, but we've been together seven years. Yeah. Any yeah. Um, any thoughts of tying the knot on the marriage front? Um, I keep dropping hints <laughs> that we should tie the knot, but the, somehow those hints aren't being taken. But uh, no, no, we are we are looking to. Um, forward other things in life. You know, we, we've been together for so long. We know each other inside out, back and front, upside down. We've been together. We weren't together. We got back together. And we realised, you know what it is, we're in this for the long run. So we're there, we're there to do the, the the family. We're there to do the kids. You know, our families all know each other. Our friends know each other. We've got, we, we're just doing the thing. We're doing the thing and rolling along with the thing and realizing we're enjoying the thing so <laughs> why not well, let's carry on with the thing so yeah it's um, a it's a bit different to how um how we were told when especially when i was growing up i don't know if it's the same for you about the fact that you'll be unhappy yeah, gay people uh-huh. they're all lonely and just live on their own and don't have any fun and don't do anything and it's like i've seen the straight world we have way more fun than you do Oh, absolutely. I think gay people completely have it so much better than part, part of all my straight friends. Um, I think we've got it so much better. We've got it so much better. And and I think with gay people as well, you know, we, we can choose to to have the life that we want. You know, I think with straight people, there is the expectation of, oh, your brother got married when he was 25, therefore you need to get married when you're 25, and you need to have three children because your brother had two, so you've got to have two that one. And I think we just kind of just are, are removed from that life, and we're over here, and we just do what we want. Yeah, and, and we have... we have. There's no comparison. No. You just do you. 
fun. And we have we have we, we sometimes have less responsibility when we particularly when we're younger before we all settle down and you know we can carry that on for longer um so when did you um when did you first sort of discover or when did you first realize that you were that you were gay oh gosh that's a that's a funny old question when did you discover you were gay i just oh god chris o'donnell is robin Ah, oh, in Batman, I have that on my wall. And that I was like, that is so many. That is be with Robin. <laughs> that is so many people's. If you people put on Twitter, it's like when what first sort of made you think, yeah. oh my god, it was like everyone says Robin. Robin, <laughs> but it's got to be yeah. Chris O'Donnell is Robin, or maybe the the Green Power Ranger. He was all right as well. <laughs> the Green Power Ranger with his little flutes and his dinosaur dinosaur. That was also a thing. That was also a thing. No, I just remember. I remember thinking, I don't, I don't like girls the way other people like it. You don't grow up and just and just one day assume you're gay. You just what you just know what you're not. Yeah. And I just knew I was not that. And in the nineties, growing up in the nineties, we had what we had Section Twenty Eight, so you couldn't talk about it. There wasn't that gay representation as, as we have now in the United Kingdom and in, in in Western societies. There wasn't that. So you just knew what you weren't. And to me, gay was always a bad thing because I remember being in schools and people saying, that's so gay, that's really gay. So that's always negative and derogatory. So I knew that I it was wrong for me to be that. Also, I was from a Catholic family. And I was head boy of a Catholic school, so I had so many. And I was a ballroom dancer. I still have a ballroom dancer where there's the male and female ballroom dancers who dance together all the time. I, I had that that world I was growing up in. I was growing up in the Catholic world. Everything around me said that what I was wasn't correct. Yeah. Well, I, I wasn't allowed to be who I was, but inside my brain, I knew I wasn't what people wanted me to be. I was what I was. And it was there's such a conflict. It was such a conflict. But growing up, and I didn't have a, um, I didn't have a Cinderella story. I, I didn't have parents that I, you know, I, I, they threw me out of the house. I didn't have that. I had a loving family. And when I came out, I was lucky to have the, the family ties around me, nurturing me and making sure I was okay and I was all right. And they allowed me to grow and be who I wanted to be. Not everybody has that. So I'm really thankful for my family for that. Really thankful when I came out. For that. It's really good. And and I was in a very I was very late coming out to people. I was in my thirties when I sort of I've no idea why. It's one thing I, I I did a podcast about mental health recently and it was sort of I was thinking, well, why why did I do that? And I couldn't really answer it because my mum and dad are all have been very accepting, very my whole family have. Um but it's always nice to, to hear other people that have that really accepting family. But yeah. obviously a lot of people don't have that. Um, they don't have that experience. Um, they, they have very bad experiences. Absolutely. And in, and in countries as well around Europe, you know, there's countries out there which do not accept you. When I took part in Mr. Gear Europe um, and I represented the UK in 2014, there was other contestants there who were representing their country but couldn't go back to their country afterwards. Yeah. There was contestants representing their country and who did go back to their country and their houses had been broken into. There was queer sprayed all over their front doors. People have found out where they live and totally tried to attack them and tried to get to them. And people fled just while representing a gay person from their country. Um, but I think it's gay people in the UK, especially because... We know we're a little bit different. We grow up and we, we kind of self-analyze ourselves, don't we, in a way that maybe heterosexual people don't. Yeah. They have that midlife crisis later on in life <laughs> where we have that crisis earlier on in life. Yeah. We've, got, we've got to assess ourselves. We've got, we don't fit into that world. We don't fit into that world. We've got to do something a little bit different. and We've got to find out where we belong when we're younger. And then once we've found out, we can mold ourselves and who we are and, and continue with our life experiences. Whereas I think maybe someone from the heterosexual community has to have that later on in life. So I think we're lucky that we get to internally analyze ourselves when we're younger. And I think that sets us up in, in a good place in life. Well, it did me, it did me, you know? Well, it did me as well. And, and then obviously when you've got the, um, when you've sort of, 
you've realised that you've, you've accepted yourself, you're gay. You've then got to figure out what part of the gay world you fit into because that's a whole nother minefield. <laughs> <laughs> what type of gay are you? Are you a tweak? Are you a top? Are you a uh, a mask? Are you a femme? Are you, uh, what? What? It's, it's a whole... <laughs> I've, I've categorised myself now. I've got to subcategorise myself. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to <laughs> And you only have until you're 40 because after old, over 40, that's it. <laughs> dead gears, dead. Yeah. You might as well be 80. Someone over 40. Everyone loves a daddy nowadays. <laughs> Everyone loves a daddy. Well, I'm 42 in 18, 19 days. So I am definitely, I'm the old age pensioners of the gay world now. Oh, happy birthday for 19 days, time. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we'll come back. Let's go, let's go back. Because you mentioned that you were, um, you trained as ballroom dancing. Um, yeah. You are a, you are a dancer. Do you, you still teaching the dancing um, I do, yes, 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 I do. Um, I started dancing when I was 13 months old. I didn't really have a say in the matter. My mum was a dancer, my dad was a dancer, my grandparents were dancers, and we were a ballroom dancing family, right? A ballroom dancing mafia. You're born into this. <laughs> and I remember there's this brilliant photo I've got of me somewhere, and I'm sat on a potty reading a Lego magazine with a tippy toppy cup in one hand, and there's ballroom dancers going around the outside of me because I'm in my mum's <laughs> ballroom bus. So as soon as I started to walk, I had to dance. I had parents who were dancers. And I can't remember my very first dance lesson. I can't remember it. You can't remember learning how to walk. I can't remember learning how to dance. And it's just been um, a fantastic experience. I've grown up um, with a ballroom dancing family. I've folded into the dancing business. Um, I was under 16 British champion, British ballroom champion. I was captain of the British squad twice for two years running when I was 15 and when I was 16. And now I continue to train British champions myself. So I've trained British solo champions, British couple champions, formation teams. Um, it's a system that I know. It's a system I, I understand. And I really enjoy my job. And not a lot of people can say they wake up every day and are buzzing to go into work. <laughs> no, and definitely I not. <laughs> I love it. I love people. I love teaching people. My youngest students are 80 months old. My oldest one is 93, and she likes to jive for an hour. Uh, I'm shattered. <laughs> By the time I'm shattered. She's ready to go again. Uh, it's brilliant. It's a brilliant job. It's a skill. It keeps you fit. It keeps you healthy. I enjoy teaching couples who come together. It's, it's a time that they put aside to learn a new skill together. They keep fit and healthy together. Um, and it's good for the brain as well. It releases all the happy hormones. So it, it's a good skill to have. So what's your... Um... What's your favourite type of ballroom dancing? Oh, my favourite ballroom dance, I love to tango. I love to tango. That's my favourite, favourite dance out of the ballroom dances. We've got waltz, foxtrot, quick step, Venus waltz and tango and tango. That's my niche. Love a tango. So have you seen an increase in the number of people doing um, ballroom dancing? Obviously, Strictly Come Dancing is such a, a massive show. It's one of those things you think that should not work. It, it just yeah. it, it shouldn't be as popular as this, but it's loved by everybody. I'm going to disagree with you there. <laughs> it should be popular. It's brilliant. It, hey, it's tell you what, it's an excellent ad free advert for me on BBC One every Sunday. It's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it should work. Ballroom dancing is fun, and it's nice that it's cool again. You know, there was a time that, like Star Trek, it went out of fashion. Now it's back in fashion. Like ballroom dancing in Star Trek is my life, and now it's cool again. So this is awesome. <laughs> uh, but yeah, ballroom dancing, it's always been a thing. It just went away from your television screens. You look back to your grandmas and your granddads and your great grandmas and your great granddads, and they always met at the dance. They always met at the dance. Grandpa would ask grandma for a dance or a waltz or a foxtrot, and everybody wanted to dance. All the fellas danced. It wasn't a gay thing back then. It was a straight thing. It was the only way you could pick up a girl. You had to go to the dance to find your partner, and that's how you met. It's always been a thing. Come Dancing came around, and then it disappeared. So the popularity wasn't out there in the media. But it's always been a bit of an underground thing going along. Then all of a sudden, Strictly comes, boom, it's back up there again. And it's fab. And I've seen a rise of younger couples coming in and enjoying ballroom dancing. Young couples together come in and enjoy ballroom dancing. My kids' classes are through the roof right now. It, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. And I think I think Strictly particularly, it's one of those shows, it's safe, it's fun, it's really heartwarming. There's a little bit of drama in there, but everybody is so nice on it. But then you mm -hmm. also get to see these people that 
have never danced before and they just develop over the 13 weeks or whatever it is that it's on um, and then by the end of the final you're properly rooting for these people that you've never met <laughs> And it's just oh, yeah. it's I mean, wonderful. I don't want to use the word journey. Yeah. But you've heard people on the journey. Don't you? <laughs> and I love the ones that I've never danced before. And the ones that are, are finding it just that little bit difficult. I love that because that person is every person who walks through my ballroom studio's door. It's, it's like you are every person I teach from scratch to get them to where they want to be. And I tell you what, it, it's just brilliant. You see the weight loss that these people lose and the toning of the muscles that they have or the ouches that they have the day after because they're using muscles they didn't realise they have. Ballroom dancing is hard. Yes, it looks pretty, but you need to have stamina to do it. You need to use your muscles. You are constantly training, training, training like you would any other sport. It's a skill, it's an art, and it keeps you fit. It, it, it baffles me why people don't do it more often. <laughs> well, I am... Um... I spoke to Lucas McFarlane. Oh, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, he was uh, a couple of weeks ago, as we were recording this, um, on the podcast. Um, and he was obviously choreographer in uh, for Strictly when they did the contemporary dancing. Um, yeah. And they brought that in, which I thought was a really good thing. Mm-hmm. But he said the same as well. He said, because I he's had a lot of injuries um, with dancing because it takes such a, a, a strain on the body. You've got to, mm-hmm. if you're doing it professional, you've got to protect your body and learn how to exercise to help your body a lot more than if you're just doing down the gym on a treadmill. Absolutely. To be a dancer, has, you have to be an athlete. You have to be an athlete. You need to use your body. Your body is your tool. You have to make sure you're, if you, if you, if you're a bit of carpenter, he always has the best tools in the box. You know, he stores always, I don't know what you do with the saw. I was going to say it's always pointy, but he stores <laughs> always pointy. Um, you know, he's always got the best screwdriver there. As a dancer, you need to make sure your body is in the best shape possible because your body is your tool. So you have to be an athlete to be a dancer. And it's I I don't I, I've never done. I'm I am one of these people that will stand at the bar if that. And if I'm very drunk, I might slightly boogie. But it's that that that's that self conscious thing. We but I love watching dance. I. It's just something contemporary I love, tap dancing I just find fascinating from your non-tap dancing, Irish dancing to the proper tap dancing. Um, yeah. But then I'll, so I'll sit there on a Saturday night watching Strictly and I'll I'll go, oh, they've missed a step there. <laughs> they've messed up on that bit. That shouldn't Everyone have happened. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, right, I'm going to guess the judges' scores. Uh, Craig is about five, ten from Shirley. Um, and it just... Oh. Yeah, it's one of those things. I've always thought, if I buy a pair of tap shoes, would I ever put them on? <laughs> do you know what? You should. You only live once. You only live once. And the hardest thing to do when you go to a dance class is to walk through that door the first time. Yeah. You should do. do it. You should do it. You've got nothing to lose. Well, I did um, I did Thai boxing um, about well, about six years ago um, when I used to live at home. And I, I, it's another thing I've ever even thought of. And that first time when you walk in, you think everybody's going to look at you and realise how crap you are. No one gives a... No one cares. No, one, no one is bothered. Say again. They're too busy thinking about themselves. <laughs> yeah. You can't kind of watch anyone around them. They need to make sure they're all right. It's when you first walk in and there's all these shirtless men everywhere and it's like, Ooh. <laughs> Oh, that's why he goes to box. <laughs> Have I walked into a sauna by accident? <laughs> You uh, so you won Mr Gay UK twenty thirteen and twenty fourteen. You won it twice. Yeah. What's that, that um What's that process like? Okay. Um. The, you want the honest answer? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um. When I won Mr Gay UK in the first time two thousand thirteen, um, you go to a nightclub, you stand in your underpants, and they. There's a panel of judges with drinks in the hand and they choose the winner. <laughs> That's it. That is it. That is all it is. And then um, when I won Mr. Gear UK, I was then offered the chance to represent the United Kingdom and Mr. Gear Europe. That is not standing in your underpants and look pretty. When you go to Mr. Gear Europe, you have to know your LGBTI rights, your LGBTI laws. There's a written test every day. There's a, an interview test every day with a panel of experts, of politicians, of magazine editors. 
there is sports round, there is a media round. Can you broadcast? Can you talk to people? Yes, there is a swimwear round. I think that counts count that is 10% of the marks for the sponsors that were sponsoring the event. And then there was a big final show. It was an online broadcast and there was an audience vote and there was an online vote. There was so much more to it than standing a nightclub with glass in your barefoot, <laughs> believing <laughs> in underpants and win with smoke and sticky floors. It was totally different. <laughs> and then um, I got second in Mr. Gear Europe and then I was invited to take part in Mr. Gear World um, to represent the UK and Europe. So I yeah, I did that. I'm a competitor. I'm a ballroom competitor. I um, I represent my country for ballroom. I would represent my country for being a gay man. I've, I've done this process since I was younger. So I thought I'll give it a go. Knowing what I had in mind for Mr. Gay Europe, I read up on my LGBTI laws. Currently, um, around Europe, around the world, the differences of where it's illegal to be gay, where you can be hung if you're gay, where you can be stoned to death. If you're gay, countries where you can't even step foot in them or you will be thrown in prison. Uh, because there's a written test every day at Mr. Gay World, there is an LGBTI, LGBTI law test every day at Mr. Gay World. You've got to be able to talk to the politicians. It was an event in Rome in 2014. You've got to be able to broadcast. There is a photogenic round, there was team building rounds, and then there was a congeniality round where all the other delegates or all the other contestants voted for who they wanted to win. So it's more than just standing in a nightclub like Mr. Gay UK was uh, with glass in your foot and your underpants. <laughs> and, and I only wanted to do Mr. Gay World, if I'm honest with you, I only wanted to do Mr. Gay World if I knew that Ireland was going to go, Northern Ireland was going to go, because I made real good friends with these guys at Mr. Gay Europe. So I thought, do you know what? You've got second in Mr. Gay Europe, Stuart. If Ireland and Northern Ireland are going to go, go along. Do what you need to do. Have a little bit of a large holiday away <laughs> off camera and uh, just enjoy yourself. Just enjoy yourself. You're not going to have this time again. So I did. And then we got through the, there was 36 different countries, USA, Canada, you know, New Zealand, Australia, India, uh, Indonesia, Germany, or, or so many different countries. And then the three of us, we were just having our large holiday and do what we needed to do and did all the tests and, and did all the exams and did all the broadcasting. And it got through the final in Rome and it was the final 10. And in the 10 was England, Ireland, Northern Ireland. And we're like, <laughs> eh? <laughs> what? We got through There was the final five. And there was me and Ireland, Greece, Venezuela, and South Africa. And I was looking at Robbie, who was Mr. Gary. I was like, how did we? What did they? What? And it came through the final three. And it was, um, it was no, sorry, it was Cyprus. It was Cyprus, um, myself, UK, and Ireland. I looked at Ireland. I was like, what? 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 He only came for the banner. <laughs> What's going on? And, uh, and he went, Stuart, I can't, I, I, I don't want to win. I don't want to, I've got to go back to university. I can't win this. Um, and they got through the final two. And I tell you what, it, it's like something out of a movie. When they announced the winner, it must, your brain must release the chemical, but my knees went all shaky and I flopped. <laughs> and the tape was going and it was outside like Big Brother, so there was fireworks going off. And I was like, oh, oh, oh. whatever was released in my brain, I couldn't move, I couldn't talk. And then they picked us up and they're like, you won, Mr. K. Will. And I'm like, eh, but I'm from South Shields. <laughs> What's going on there? Um, and it was fun. It was nice. It was a good ride. Um, and I was able to go on and promote my anti-bullying and uh, homophobia awareness campaign called So What? around so many different countries. And it took me around the world. And it still is active online now. The trans community are jumping on board. Um, communities that suffer against racism are jumping on board. It's just a simple slogan which says some of us have got blue eyes. Some of us have got green eyes. Some of us are straight. Some of us are gay. So what? Yeah. And I take it into schools and we talk into schools with children um, because I don't want children to go through what I went through when I was younger because I was bullied for being, well, I was bullied for being a dancer, first of all. I was bullied for having ginger hair. I was bullied for having glasses. I loved Star Trek and I was a closeted homosexual in the 90s. I mean, like, if there was a target on my back, it was for me. <laughs> I, I don't want any children to go through what I went through. So we go through, we go into schools and I get the children to paint the hands in rainbows. And we push the hands onto pieces of paper and we cut out the hands. 
and they've got them there. And we build a tree, and the hands make leaves, rainbow leaves on this tree. Um, and if, if any of the children ever feel attacked or if any of the children feel like they want to talk to someone they trust about what they're feeling inside, they find someone they want to talk to, someone who they trust, whether it's a friend, a dinner lady, a teacher, and they go to the soul what tree, they sit under the soul what tree, and they talk in confidence to uh, to their peers. And it, it's it's been really interesting. It's been really nice to do that. Um, and it's nice to hear the feedback from some of the children and some of the children do confide in you about their their personal feelings that maybe they aren't heteronormative and they might want to live the life that we lead. Yeah. Um, how do they go about it? And and luckily, when when people do talk to me about that, I've usually got the backings of parents as well, and it's really nice to hear that. Um, so it, it does go into so many different avenues, my So What campaign. It's been really, really productive. I'm so thankful to to be able to do that through schools because of the platform that I've had with Mr. Gay Europe and Mr. Gay World. Um, and then coming off the back of that, the Mr. Gay Europe company asked me to come on board as the managing director and um, and and just jigging around a bit. So now, um, because Mr. Gay UK no longer is running, I've split the United Kingdom up into uh, England, Wales and Scotland as part of the, the countries to take part in Mr. Gear Europe, where you have to give back to your community if you want to be a part of Mr. Gear Europe or Mr. Gear World. So part of the contest now is not standing in your underpants with glass in your foot while you're bleeding <laughs> in a crowded nightclub <laughs> where people are drunk. It, it's a big event. You know, the, the marks now are 10% of them is a swimwear round, so that is there for the sponsors. 10% of it is a formal round for suits. And 10% is a national costume to represent your country. So that's 30% of the marks, which are, if you want, aesthetic based are on the stage. Yeah. And it is a stage and it's an event where all friends and family are welcome. But 70% of the marks are made up of a written test. 70% of the marks are written up of how much you've given to charity. And the charities this year for the contest are the Charlie and Carter Foundation, which give back to children and families who are um, to families who have got children who are maybe stillborn or who are terminally ill in hospital. The money's going to help support those families. So moms and dads that might have to take time off work or have had to give up jobs just to look after their children in hospital. And the other charity that we're running for is Northern Pride this year as well for the mental health um, foundations, which they work with. And then there is a congeniality round as well. So the delegates have to choose who they would like to win if they don't too. So there's a lot more elements which come into it that um, on the written test as well, there's a written test and they've all got to know their LGBTI rights as well because that is something you need if someone is going to talk about gay rights. You can't just stand and look pretty in your underwear. No one cares about that. You've got to know your stuff. You've got to be able to talk to your community. You've just got to be able to talk. You've got to know what you're talking about. So that's why... I separated the United Kingdom into England, Wales, and Scotland when I was given the managing director role of Mr. Gear Europe. And then all these delegates have to have a project, which if they win, they've got to give back to their community. Mr. Gear England 2016 had a brilliant project called Pride Families, which he spoke about LGBTI adoption and fostering because he was a former foster carer. Uh, so he's organised big fostering events down south in Brighton. Mr. Gay Wales, 2016, he was uh, in the army. So he came up with Pride Soldiers. So he talked about what it's like to be LGBT in the army. Mr. Gay England, 2018, the last one which we had before the coronavirus kicked off, um, is HIV positive. And he's talking about knowing your status and, and being open and honest about your status and and that HIV doesn't define you. So we need to have those voices in our community. Winning uh, the Miss Gay UK, Miss World, uh, Miss Gay World, gave you a proper platform to to go out there and and fight f- for rights of, of people, rights of, um, of 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 the community, um, and also it sounds like to me it, it's something that you've got a great passion for, which is brilliant to see because we we need yeah. people because we're we're at a point now where I think we've we've got a lot. We've, we've gained a lot. We've got the gay marriage. We've got more equal rights, all this sort of stuff. Still can't give blood, though, can we? No, still can't give blood. Um, no, unless, that... unless you haven't had um, sex for, is it 12 months? Three months. Three it's months. gone 12 months to three months. But still, I mean, I'm in a monogamous relationship with my partner. 
And if my mom was in an accident in the car, like, uh, heaven forbid, if she was in an accident and she needed a blood transfusion, she they're not allowed to take my blood. But that then blood a straight, could... then a straight, but a straight person who could have slept oh, with anybody just, can just walk in the next day and, and give it. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. It's does, it, it, it doesn't it's make sense. Um, Iceland, I think Iceland removed that ban last year. Uh, I just hope that the rest of the Europe and the world will follow. Well, they test the blood there, don't they now? Yeah, they, yeah, te- I mean, they test the blood for all. Oh, all... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and having blood from a gay person won't turn you gay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and obviously, so we are very much in. We have in this country. We are we are fairly fortunate. I think there is an undercurrent still of of homophobia. Um, of it's now moving transphobia. Um, and and our, our trans allies and and they're now. It seems to be that people have almost not lost the fight with gay people, but it's moved on now. The trans people are now the next minority that they're going to. No, can you, and... can you believe it? I mean, if it wasn't for a black trans woman, we, we wouldn't even have pride. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Stonewall yeah, and everything yeah. that we've got to the trans community. Yes, and 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 it it amazes me. I I used to do um, hospital radio um, ten years ago. And we had this um, this woman in who was a, a trans woman um, later in life. Um, she'd lived her whole life, married, kids, gone through that whole life. And she got to, I think she was about 55, 60. And, and she came out as, as trans. And she did the, um, she went through the whole process. Um, and she would still, when she was walking through the town, people would come up to her that she's never met, no, and they would abuse, throw abuse at her. Mm-hmm. And... I don't know if it's because being a gay person, I, I'll speak personally for me. I find I, I hate bullying. I was bullied at school. I, I detest bullying. I detest discrimination, all of that sort of stuff. And I never figure out why someone that is trans walking down the street, do, why would anybody think it's their right to abuse them? It makes no sense. It doesn't. It really doesn't. And I don't know if it's maybe the insecurities that, to me, I, I, I try to think about this the other day, especially with the Donald Trump thing at the moment and the, the transphobia over there. But I think that maybe every time we we see, or we gain a little bit of extra rights for our LGBTI community, I think otherwise the the wider community thinks that it's one off for them. Yeah, we're trying we're trying to 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 have an equal. A, a, an equal level of rights throughout the world, but I think that if someone thinks oh, the LGBTI community has gained a right, they've gone down. So I think that's why they fight back because the LGBTIQ plus community is going to take over the world. It'll be <laughs> a better place. Will <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with our secret sprinkly blood of fierce sparkles and our giant unicorns, which will ride in like Valkyries. Ah! Well, we would control the weather. You know that, don't you? That was in well, actually, um... actually my boyfriend is a weatherman and he does control the weather. <laughs> <laughs> well it was <laughs> It was UKIP that um it was yeah. one of the UKIP ones that says, Oh, it's it, the gay it, it's raining because of the gays or something like that and it's like, What? If I could control the this weather, is... I wouldn't have weather like this. We'd have it hot all the yeah, time so ex- we could wear speedos. Yeah, exactly. We'd flaunt <laughs> it. <laughs> Come on, you <laughs> We wouldn't have rain and thunder and lightning and snow. Yeah. Not a chance. No, and we'd want it. It's rain and men. <laughs> Ooh, sorry, that's a stereotype. <laughs> I play that card. I play stereotypes all the time. It's it's you have to you have to take advantage of it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we're obviously the stuff that's in America. Trump is just oh, uh, if he gets in for another four years. God help us and God help America. I don't, I don't understand what Twitter's doing at the moment. I tweeted this today because someone like Katie Hopkins who can tweet about, um, but she can just tweet her hate speech. When she was removed from Twitter, she she was banned and she was removed and her platform was taken away. But Donald Trump is allowed to tweet worse things than Katie Hopkins and stay on Twitter. Now I don't know if Twitter's kind of going, well, give someone enough rope and they're leaving them on there. <laughs> But yes. I, I, I read today that somebody copied and pasted Donald Trump's, Trump, Donald Trump's tweets and put it on their account and Twitter banned their account. Yeah. What's yeah. going on? I know. What's it's, going on? 
Um, and what did he tweet yesterday? Um, oh yeah, white oh, power video. White power, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah. <sighs> Come on, Gerald, sort yourself out. Anyway, it's... he's not white; he's orange. Yeah. <laughs> orange power. There was Come a on, brilliant Gerald. photo of him when he was coming back from his amazing one million ticket um, rally, which had six thousand two hundred people in there. Um, there was this picture of him with a white shirt that was just orange all around the collar. Oh, and the no. <laughs> Oh um, no, Donald! Not the Santa Fe. Oh. <laughs> we are in a we are in a very. It's been a, a really odd year this year. We've had obviously had coronavirus. Um, we had all the the god awful stuff in, in America for the um, George Floyd. Um, all the Black Lives Matter. And if I hear one more person say White Lives Matter, I will <sighs> punch them in the face. I don't want to progress violence, but rah! Um, <laughs> it's so annoying. Um, <laughs> You're sparkly blood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's it and it's um yeah it's just a real oh, it's just a very strange year and i, and I don't know where it's gonna go isn't it it's yeah. a year of flux yeah there, there is something in the air we are changing this is the year where things are turning and i think things it's like the old saying says when someone's ill or what the old wives say was it's got to be worse before it gets better <laughs> so i think we've got your likes of donald trump and we've we've almost don't want to say we have to have that but it had had to be seen to know we were not going to do that again. You know, that, that's what we've had. We've had all these right wing governments. Well, we don't want that again. And I think we need these people as examples for history to learn from. And we've got another four years of one. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like Mr. Trump Jr. Um, there you are. Um, so going back to the, the your your So What campaign, it's a real, yeah. it's a real simple, sort of simple premise in that, so what? So what if you're, um, what, what? colour your skin is? So what if you're gay? So what if you this, that and the other? Um, where do you, where do you see that going? Because obviously the school, we had recently uh, last year when the schools were teaching more about gay marriage and they had that, uh, the book that came out and then you had all the protests around that. There's still lots of work to do. So something like the so what, is it something you'd like to, to see being done nationally around the, yeah, around the country? absolutely. I, I go into schools and we run assemblies with it um, as well. And I mean, it covers, it, it really covers sociology, it covers art, it covers speaking and listening. Um, it covers so many different boxes. It ticks so many different boxes on the education front. I have been talking with Parliament, and I am invited down to Parliament usually once or twice a year to talk about what's going on with the Stonewall campaign. So hopefully that they're going to adopt it and put it through to the education system. But with the talks, what we do is I go into schools and we chat with the kids and we have a bit of a laugh with them. So, you know, we'd say to the children, if, if the sun's in your eyes and it's hurting your eyes, what would you do to protect yourself? You put on your sunglasses. Yeah. And I've normally got these big, massive sunglasses. You like something from the big breakfast, Zick and Zag we have. <laughs> and we bring a child up. We say, well done, you said sunglasses. We put the sunglasses on this kid's head. And we say, right, it's raining, it's throwing it down, the weather's coming, you're all wet. What would you do to protect yourself? Put up an umbrella. Yeah, can you come in and a bright big umbrella and stand there with the umbrella next to the guy with the Zick and Zag sunglasses. And we say, okay, it's really cold and your neck's really cold and the wind's blowing on your neck. What would you do to protect yourself? So, 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 so I'd wear a scarf. Yeah, come here, you come here. It this massive round scarf. All it's usually big and wrapped around all the way down the leg. So the kids are laughing and having a go. So I say, okay, what do you do if someone says something bad about you? What do you say? If you, what do you say if someone's saying horrible about you? What do you say that? Use a protective word, and you can own that, and you can say, so what? If someone says you're gay, so what? Yeah. If someone says you've got your four eyes, so what? If someone says you're wearing a sari, so what? If someone says you're wearing a kilt, so what? Do you think Harry Potter cares that he's being called four eyes with his magical powers? <laughs> no, he doesn't. Do you know what Harry Potter thinks? So what? Yeah. It's water off a duck's back. It's a form of it's a form of protection. You can own that. And those words are quite powerful. And the kids love the assemblies. Then we get them to take their hands and, and they get messy. And kids love to get messy anyway. So they, they, they take something away from that. And it's really nice to hear the feedback from the schools. And it hasn't always been great. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. There's some schools we've gone into where the parents have not allowed the children to take part in the assemblies. The parents don't agree with that. Um, not all the time, but, but some of the time. Um, sometimes it is religion-based. 
So if the, the, the children are of a certain religion, the parents, it doesn't go with that religion, so they are removed from the assembly or they go and do something else. But the kids that we've got that take part, the feedback that we get back, it's brilliant. And you make it interactive with the children and you make them listen. And I'm a dance teacher, so I work with kids. So luckily I kind of, well, I've got a mentality of a five-year-old as well. <laughs> Luckily, you can kind of, I was going to say come down to their level, but I think I should just say not their level. Um, and you talk talk to children. Don't talk at children. Talk to kids. They're cleverer than you think, and they can teach us a lot more than we actually know. Um, and it, it's it's a, it's an interactive process, the So What campaign, especially in schools and the assemblies. But you can also join in online. You can write So What on the palm of your hand and take a selfie. And everybody loves a selfie. So you write, so what in the palm of your hand? Hold your hand out the camera as so well. You try to stop homophobia. And then just write the tagline online. Some of us have got blue eyes. Some of us have got green eyes. Some of us are straight. Some of us are gay. So what? It's a selfie with a positive message. And we all have selfies, so there's no harm in just spreading the message. And so it's a good, positive um, campaign if i do say so myself it's it's really going well so i'm, I'm quite happy with it yeah yeah that's really good and it's it's one of those things no one is born homophobic no one is born racist no one is born whatever we're taught that through family through religion through through whatever process people mm. are taught that that is wrong that is right and it's it, it makes me laugh that people that i'm not going to send my child to this lesson about um gay rights and and um, but I am going to send them to a lesson where it teaches them to live by the rule of a Bible or live by the rule of a, a religious book. And it's I don't want to, I don't want your right. I don't want your views enforced on my child, but I am going to enforce the views of this on my child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, well, to me, I was brought up in a Catholic school as well. I got an A and R I was well for that. <laughs> I, that one time. I should have been like a, a nun or something like that. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I think the thing is with kids, kids are clever. And if you keep something from a child, it becomes taboo. And if it's taboo, it's forbidden. If it's forbidden, they want to know what it is. Yeah. And they will go and they, I mean, you, I used to look at what like pubes meant in the dictionary when I was a kid. <laughs> I've got your pubes out. I thought, what's pubes? <laughs> in, the, in the old Oxford dictionary, it was there. So nowadays, it's like, oh, did you go, do you know what your gay is? Do you know what gay is? And they, if they know, they know. And kids talk amongst themselves anyway. And they've got mobile devices and they can look it up and Google it. But have an honest conversation with the kids. You know, um, if you talked out, if you, I remember some of the parents that, that I teach talk to the children. You know, you know, Stuart, your teacher, Stuart, he's, he's got a boyfriend. And the kids go, all right, okay, have a biscuit. <laughs> yeah. That's it. <laughs> Done. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is fab. And um, one, one respect, it's good that the parents are, 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 are happy enough to have that conversation. And in other respects, do you know, kids don't care. <laughs> No. And if you can talk to the younger generation about that, then that generation will grow and hopefully that generation will then pass that on to the next one and the next one. And maybe it'll become as archaic as racism is to me. I know it's a big thing right now, but to me, I don't understand racism. No. I, I went to school with so many different people from so many different, I know I went to a Catholic school, but there was so many people from different religions and creeds and, and coloured skins. In, in my school, and it didn't bother me. I don't understand it. Even when we had at school, show racism the red card. It was pictures of footballers with show racism the red card in school. I didn't understand what racism was. I still don't understand why people think differently that way. Um, so hopefully, with passing on that knowledge about what gay just actually is, that the next generation will grow up, and the next one, and the next one, and homophobia will just become extinct. Who was your... Um... Who was your role model when you were younger, growing up as a as a as a, as a gay lad? What was because obviously, uh, uh, yeah, we didn't have loads. There was no there was uh, when I was growing up, it was Graham Norton, Paul Paul O'Grady, all those sort of things. But did you yeah. have a, a a a gay role model as you were growing up? Do you know I don't think I did have a gay role model growing up. I tell you why because there wasn't a lot of gay people out there when yeah. I was growing up, and you didn't know if they were gay. I think that the the closest thing I remember to a gay role model at the time was Stephen Gately when he came out. Um, it was all over the front of the sun. I was like, oh, he's what I am. You know, he's what I am. Yeah. And, and, and that was the thing. Or Brian Dowling from Big Brother 
back in the day. You know, that was that. I mean, there was Queer as Folk, but that was on late at night on, on Channel 4 at 11 o'clock, and you weren't supposed to watch that, even though I did in my bedroom, you know. Uh, <laughs> Snap. Yeah. <laughs> that, first, like that? that first Jumping scene of... That first scene is queer as folk. Yeah. When he comes oh, back, that... comes back from the nightclub, it's like, whoa! <laughs> I remember the, is that what I'm going to do? I just want to keep on these things. No one's going down there. <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't know if I had a gay role model as such, but I did have a role model in my granddad and my granddad. He was such an amazing chap. Bless, you know, he was it. I, I know we use the phrase gentleman all the time, but he was a gentle man and he had manners and he treated people with respect and he was funny and he danced and he was my role model growing up. Yeah. That's good. Because I think now, I think I think sport is a major thing. I think there still needs to be that. We, we've obviously got the likes of, of Tom Daly, who's who's come out and is, is, a, is an amazing role model for, for younger people. Um, and Gareth Thomas, who has, has come out as gay and is, is now was pretty much forced to, but has come out as HIV positive and is doing lots of good work there. I think we still need that premiership footballer. We still need that. There's no gays in football, man. Uh, no, I know. None it's of them. Like there's no gays in Russia. There's no gays in Russia. There's no gays in football. It's a myth. It's a myth. Have you watched the new Eurovision film on Netflix? <laughs> that's where I got that line from <laughs> it's it is one of those I, I watched it on Friday and it's like <laughs> it, it is as camp as Eurovision um, it's as stupid as Eurovision but it is so much fun and it was yeah. that film will, that will never be shown in Russia at all <laughs> and keep an eye out for little elves that want to stab you in the back <laughs> mm. I'm not a great Will Ferrell fan but I thought that it was just it was such perfectly pitched and then when they had that sing along with all the, the Eurovision entries <laughs> oh, I love little Alexander Ryback with his fiddle. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I know him. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk. Come dine with me. You were on Come Dine with Me. How many years ago? <laughs> yeah, I was. Yeah, that was a thing as well. Yeah, Come Dine with Me. Because uh-huh. I'm, I like Come Dine with Me. It's one of those shows you can put on and just um, and watch and, and not. And it's the narrator whose name I can't remember now is um, just pitches it perfectly most of the time. But I'm really interested in behind the scenes stuff. So, <laughs> Come Dine With Me okay. is five half hour episodes, five nights, going around different people's houses. How long are you recording that show for? Because it's it must be okay. hours. Okay, it is hours. Um, I mean, I started my filming at eight o'clock in the morning, and I think we ended at two o'clock in the morning. <sighs> Um, I know. And then because I was the first night, I had so many strangers just coming to my house. I had production, I had crew, I had producers, I had cameramen, I had strangers I had to cook for. I was like, what did I say? What is going on right now? Uh, but yeah, and then you do your, so you do all your prep and then you, you, you knock the door and you open it and then my door didn't open too much. So I opened it, I went, hello. And then can you do that? I went, goodbye. <laughs> and you pretend you were saying hello to somebody again. Um, and everyone came into my house and and I cooked for them. But the one thing you don't tell you is when you hand over the food, it's cold or going colder because the amount of shots they've got to take if you're putting it down and cooking it in the kitchen and then they've got to sit and look and they eat your food, but you're not allowed to talk about the temperature of the food because it is colder. But then on the flip side, on my dessert, which happened at one o'clock in the morning, <laughs> My my ice cream melted. <laughs> it was so long. I was like, oh man. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was a, it was a, it was an experience that I thoroughly enjoyed. And unlike other reality shows, I thought I honestly thought they thought that we weren't going to get on because they had you know they had the game, the footballer, the cougar, the hippie, and the student, and. We're Geordies, so we all got on. <laughs> Mint, like, Yari, Yari, I can't tell you. Hey, come on, we have this, isn't it? I, do you want that scrum? Oh, come on then. <laughs> and then in between takes, you're not allowed to talk to each other. Oh, really? Like, you're not allowed to talk to each other. Whatever you've got to say has to be said on camera. <laughs> uh, you're not allowed to talk about yourself or your background until it's your night. So after the first night, um, night number two, during takes, I could talk about um, life in the universe and put the worlds to rights because there was nothing that people needed to know about me on camera. 
So I'm oh, 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 in between takes. And the second night, the you know the, the the night after that, the next person could talk in between takes. So bless the poor woman on night five. No one knew anything about her <laughs> <laughs> until we got to her house. I, it was a great bunch of people. We still keep in contact with each other. We have got a WhatsApp group. We do meet up. We do chat. We don't want to cook for each other ever again. So we do go out to restaurants. <laughs> and it was a really good laugh. Um, I was drunk for most of it. Um, that's two, three, and four. I thought, well, I've got my night out of the way with. Because when you go in between takes, they go, have a drink. Have a drink. Have a drink. I go, oh, that's free. That's not cool. <laughs> well, when you talk in the taxi, <clears> there at one point, down this taxi, I was like, oh, it's brilliant, though, brilliant. Um, so after my first night, thoroughly enjoyed it. But you've got to take the week off work, so you film from nine in the morning if it's your day, or eight in the morning till later on at night, and then you go and do your bits in hotels and restaurants and talk about what your menu is going to be like. And then the, the taxis pick you up at three o'clock, uh, and then you go and you sit outside someone's house for two hours while this mic you up with sound and send you in one at a time so you don't see each other, but you can blatantly see each other because you're in the taxi next. And then you're all right. Someone's gone. What are we doing? Um, so that was that. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a good time. But the taxis on the way back, you know, the taxis you go home in. Yeah. That's not your taxi. That's not your taxi. They've done it all up with the lights and you're talking away and, or sliding down in my case if you've had one too many or, or nine or 12. And you're given your number, then you get out of that taxi, and you get into another taxi to go home. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It was good. It was good fun. Um, it was definitely an experience. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I made some great friends from it. We're still in contact. Um, yeah, brilliant. Brilliant time. Brilliant time. Is there, um, you know, when, because there's some points in it where it's almost like they've gone, we missed that line on camera. Can you do that again? And we'll try and make it look really natural. And then it's, it's, if it's like if you tell someone to walk in front of a camera naturally, they'll walk in the most unnatural way possible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, like it's every time you see someone do it, it's just weird. So did they do that? Did they go, oh, we didn't catch that. Can you redo that bit for us? Um, not, no, no, they didn't. Not with us. But the, the one thing they did make one of the ladies do was um, she was pretending with a hacker. She was just going, bah, bah, bah. <laughs> She was doing this hacker at the table and asked her to do it again. Um, and they said... They said, could you just do that again? So she did it again. And you went, oh, did you not get it the first time? They went, no, we just wanted to see you do it again. <laughs> um, but no, it was a brilliant experience. I'm, I, it sounds so corny to say that everyone got on. <laughs> but we did. We got on. But the editing, they were very clever with the editing. Because in our, in, in, in our week, they made the footballer lad look a bit like a div. Um, and he was picking on the older woman. But there was one... It was one episode when he was talking about it, going, oh, you're proper old, you are. So she was giving it back. But what they didn't show you was she started it because she swore she went, oh, you effing this and that and that. And then he joined in with, oh, you're proper old, you are. And then she fought back. But all you saw was him calling her about her age, but they, they skipped the bit <laughs> in front. So the editor is very clever, very clever. Um but luckily, I thought, oh, my God, they're just going to show me as a, as a piss head. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't, thank goodness. <laughs> it was good fun. It was good fun. Good fun. It's, I, I love... I, 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 if I, I go... I've seen, I've seen a couple of TV shows, but I've went to see Pointless, and I've seen Big Brother launch night. Um, I went to that live. I spend most of my time looking at what the production crew are going, because I find mm. that... I love that part, that behind-the-scenes part of it. I yeah. find it fascinating. Yeah. Um, would you do something like Big Brother? Um, I well, <laughs> they did have me down to go in as reserve one year. Um, I'm glad I didn't. Um, so there was that. It came off the the when the wins were quite recent. Um, but no, not now. I, since since within Mr. Gay, Mr. Gay World, I was lucky enough to um, to be you know do all these interviews and everything. And like you, I was like, what's going on behind the scenes? What's the production? What's this? What's that? Okay, you're interviewing me, but what's going on over there? And, and from the back of that, I was given my own radio show on Pride Radio. So that was a fantastic experience. So now I broadcast every Sunday on Pride Radio, which is fantastic, which has led me on to working for the BBC as well, um, on BBC One. So I do work for Inside Out, which is a documentary show, and we cover all different topics. And I was so happy, so happy they gave me the topic last year to talk about same-sex ballroom dancing 
because it was like you're being gay <laughs> and ballroom dancing. So we talk about same-sex ballroom dancing or same-gendered ballroom dancing. Instead of the traditional man and woman, we were allowed to investigate and discover the man-man dancers and the female-female dancers. So that was an interesting experience as well. Um, so yes, like you said, going in and, and watching these shows to know what's going on behind the scenes, I've been lucky enough to, to land the a lot of jobs from it, which has been fantastic because it, it all pays the mortgage, doesn't it? You know, we all got each. <laughs> um, do you think, I, I remember I went to um, Blackpool Pride um, and they had the UK um, UK dan- male dancing. So it was, it was gay dancing. So it was male, male dancing. Um, yeah. And I must admit, when I first saw it, I thought, that looks a bit strange. And I think that's because it's it's nothing we've never, I'd, I'd never seen it before. And even... It, not strange as in a bad way and all that's disgusting, but just like, that's a bit different. Um, yeah, I think we're conditioned, aren't we, to yes. look at a man, woman, ballroom dancing, because that's what we've seen on Come Dancing. That's what we've grown up with. That's what we see on Strictly Come Dancing, which is the biggest rated show, as we said, on television. But, you know, you go back to traditional tangos, and traditional tangos were done by the gypsies around the campfires, and it was two men. Tango was danced by two men, men who would fight like stags around the campfire for the attention of a woman. Yeah. And then you look back at, let's go back to World War II, when all the fellas went off to war and they they left the ladies behind. What are they going to do? Stay in the kitchen all day uh, and cook for no one that's coming home. Of course they didn't. They went off to the village halls and they danced together. And it's perfectly acceptable for two women to dance together, you know, Auntie Mavis will dance with Auntie Matilda. I don't have an Auntie Mavis and Auntie Matilda. It's just <laughs> or you look at, you know, two sisters that can dance together, two two lady friends can dance together. But as soon as you see two men dance together, you kind of go, that's gay. Yeah, it's really strange. But then if you look at two, two male hip-hop dancers yeah. or a crew of all male street dancers who will dance street together like diversity, that's not gay. No. It's, yeah. So why are we conditioned to think two male ballroom dancers is homosexual, but two male hip hop dancers is heterosexual? Yeah, that's that it's a really good point. You don't even you don't even think about it when it's it's street dance or anything or a tap dance or even anything yeah. like that. Yeah, you look at Fred Astaire doing tap dance with Gene Kelly, that's yeah. not gay. Yeah. But if you religions um, and some families have the, the men in one one side and the women in the other, the men and the women aren't allowed to dance together. Yeah. So the men will dance together in a circle and the women will dance together in a circle. <laughs> so it, there's so much thing, there's so there's so many connotations with two men doing ballroom which just implies homosexuality. You know, I dance with my brother all the time. I danced with my brother when we were teaching because my brother's a professional dancer as well. But we use that to demonstrate. I dance with my, my male students. If I've got boys in that, that, that need to dance, I'll come here. I'll dance for you. But that's not gay. That's just teaching. So we kind of got to figure out why, what in our society tells us that two men dancing together is gay. There's something it's... lodged in there that goes all the way back on what we've been conditioned to that we aren't aware of yet so i'm I'm, yeah got to find that yeah and it's do you think we'll see because obviously we had dancing on ice um had um ian hopkins uh hopkins it was ian it was h from states yeah is that ian Ian hopkins no that's not his surname watkins Watkins. (laughs) there we go i'll call that that. (laughs) um so we had ian watkins on um come down uh, come down with me dancing on ice um he has been (laughs) yes i think he has hasn't he um and that got it got rave reviews. Everyone, it was really, really well received. Apart from the odd few that wrote and yeah. complained, and you know, well, whatever. Yeah. Um, do you think we'll see it on Strictly? Probably not this year. I, I maybe this year, but it might be less because of um, however they're going to do Strictly this year with social distancing. Yeah. Um, do you think we'll? Uh, do you think we'll see that soon on Strictly? The thing is, I mean, when you were talking about the negative press from there, the thing the thing that got me, I remember watching Good Morning Britain, I think it was the, the DUP health secretary, I believe. He said, it's not family viewing. And I hit the roof because I thought, yeah, mate, 
What do you class as a family? You can have single parent families. You can have families with two dads. You can have families with two mums. So you've got so many different families. So what do you class as a family? Um, so I do think that two men dancing together is family viewing. I do think the BBC will do it. I don't think, I feel, I think there might be a bit of pressure to do it, but but rightly so. Yeah. Um, but my challenge to the BBC was, I tell you what, BBC, why don't you do two same-sex couples having all male couple and an all female couple. Yeah. Do something different. Have two same sex couples in. Yeah. It's it'd be really interesting. It's, it'd be really interesting. I will probably get very angry on Twitter. <laughs> Is he need to walk past? <laughs> yeah. You can walk past. Uh, <laughs> come through. <laughs> That's the way. <laughs> can I come past Jed? <laughs> um. Yeah, I think it'd be really interesting, and as I say I'll probably get really angry on Twitter because there'll be the the morons that will do what will say what they say. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think it'll be really interesting. I hope it happens soon. Um, See, to me, when I look at dancing, I don't look at genitals. No, <laughs> I don't look at genitals. If I'm judging dancing, I will judge your characterization. I will judge your te- technique. I will look at your footwork. I will look at your style. I will look at how the overall package looks. I will look at you know. <laughs> I won't. If I'm I won't. viewing it, I may look. I may look at the bum. Well, I will look at the entire package as it is, and is that dancing good? Yeah. When I judge dancing, you know, ninety percent of the ballroom and Latin American competitive circuit out there are same-sex dancers because two women who dance together. Yeah. There's a shortage of men, so it's two women who will dance together. So when you have these professionals like James Jordan who is an absolute pillock tweeting things online. It's not right. It's not normal. Shut up, James Jordan. You were taught by a male dancer and you would have had to dance with him at one point. You would have had to dance with him at one point. If you are in this world that which you say you are from, you are from our world, you know that two ladies dance together all the time. So when he's off and away and he's doing these silly little interviews, he's only doing it for the money to get his profile back up. Not a lover of him, no. You need to encourage dancing in all its forms. And I recently judged the Equality Dancing Circuit, which was brilliant. It's a new circuit. And it's got your traditional male-female dancers competing against all male dancers, competing against all female dancers, competing against a couple, which was the new section. It's a male-female section, but where the female would dance what was traditionally the man, and the man would dance which was what was traditionally the woman. So you've yeah. got four different types of couples all against each other. And it was marvellous to watch. Marvellous to watch. And I encourage anybody to start dancing ballroom and Latin in whatever form you want to take your couple. Do it. Excellent. Um, we're going to, we'll, we'll finish off. I, um, you've mentioned Star Trek. Um, I am, more, I am more Star Trek person than I am a Star Wars person. Oh, good man. Good man. <laughs> you are, you are, you gain some brownie points right now. <laughs> well, if ever, whenever it's the, um, May the fourth be with you. That that goes around every year. I always post about it being um, May the fourth be with you, live long and prosper. All that sort of. I mix them up and it really oh, annoys many, people. How many tweets oh, do you get? Yeah. That one. And it's even someone I work with is um, is mad Star Wars, absolutely mad. And I will always say, well, they're just average films. Ha! <laughs> he hates that. He gets so angry. Um, what did you think of Picard? I love Star Trek oh, Picard. I wasn't absolutely it? loved it. Um, I thought it was, it, it was all, it, it, but at the beginning, I felt it was like Downton Abbey in space because <laughs> yeah. it was just like chugging along and it's all <laughs> little space and time. And then at the end, it just went, here's everything at the end. Ah. <laughs> and then when Commander Riker showed up with all these armada of ships, I never jumped up and tell it before, went, yes. <laughs> It was fantastic. Even though they were all copy and paste ships, it was fantastic. I totally enjoyed it. And it also opens up so many different um so many different paths as well, because without putting the spoilers to it, if Picard is who he is now, it brings so many different thought processes in because again without any spoilers, look look away or, or, or <laughs> close your ears for 10 seconds because if his consciousness can be transported into a different Picard body, it could be transported into so many different bodies and he could end up like Doctor Who. <laughs> yes. you, know, you could have a different actor play him and if Star Trek Discovery is all the way in the 31st century now, this is the 31st century, if Star Trek Discovery is all the way in the 31st century, 
there's no reason why Picard can't be over there in somebody else's body. <laughs> I never thought of that. That's a yeah. Because I, I, I when I watched it and when Data, no spoilers. Um, it's been out for ages. You should have watched it by now. <laughs> um, when when Data finally sort of said goodbye, <gasps> and, when they pulled out the USD. Oh, it was really sad. Proper. Yeah, I yeah. loved it. I love. I I wasn't quite sure to start with like yourself and then but then by third episode in it was like oh, this is just yeah bad. and when they when they pulled out the usbs and they sang the song blue skies which was reminiscent of what they did in nemesis did you realize the lady singing blue skies was the lady who played his daughter no the actress it was the actress who played um sutra and and all the other oh i've forgotten the um but then it was her with android daughter it was her who sang blue skies no. so it was like <laughs> have you listened to the full soundtrack the um the opening yeah. thing oh it's yeah. isn't it it's and discovery as well oh it's yeah it, um so yeah discovery um i can't wait third series are we on yeah we will be third, third series. series comes out later on this year because that goes into the 31st yes. century it's cool to like star trek now yeah and then you've got star trek lower decks which is coming out which is a new cartoon animated series by the guys who did rick and morty and then you've got Star Trek Strange New Worlds, which is the Captain Pike spin-off, which is coming as well. Star Trek Prodigy, which is meant to be a new Nickelodeon television series. But there's a Section 31 series with Michelle Yeoh. Know. It's like, it is cool to be gay and like Star Trek. Finally. <laughs> it's always taken me to this point of my life for it to be cool. And it is that type of that show, not so much the, the older version, because it was, you know, they, it, it was still a bit taboo to have a gay couple and they had the... Um, although obviously you had the biggest gay actor in the world in Star Trek originally, um, True. Um, Ooh. but Ooh. it is that world now where in Discovery the Doctor and the um, scientist—I can't remember what position he was—Stamets and Culber. Yes, that was it. They were yeah. a, a gay couple, and it was just like, oh well, they, they're just normal, as in, yeah. <laughs> and it's that whole thing. We can get to that point. We'll be all fine. Absolutely. And, you know, it's like, hang on a minute, you can, because back in the 90s, I was going, hang on, you can have a Klingon made with a human, you can have a Vulcan made with a Ferengi, but you can't have a man made with a man. What? <laughs> Come on, Star Trek, get with it. It's and now very... they've done it, and they've made it so normal, which is what it should be. It shouldn't be, this is the gaze. <laughs> it should just be, here's two people in love. Yeah. And that's exactly what it should be. Yeah. And that brings us really... Nice full circle in our uh, in our talk, um, Stuart. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. It's been really really interesting and really fun. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. So, where can we find you? Give us give your plug. Um, where can we find you? Where can we listen to you on the radio and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, um, if you want to listen to me, I am on eighty nine point two FM Pride Radio, which is digital and broadband. Or if you're in the northeast, it's it's on FM in your cars. Uh, if you want to follow me on all social media platforms, I am Stuart Hatton Junior. On Twitter, Mr. Gay World, Stuart Hatton Jr. On Instagram, or just Stuart Hatton Jr. On Facebook. Um, if you want to see pictures of me and my mum, then look at that. <laughs> and if you follow on Twitter, you will see the early morning pictures. Yeah, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see all the other fans. <laughs> Not quite only the fans yet, please no. <laughs> <laughs> oh no 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 no! I'm ready to get married and set down and, and get stretch marks for the baby. No only fans for me. No enough for me. Thank God. I'm a BBC boy now. <laughs> do you know, I do think sometimes, I think all these people that are suddenly starting only the fans, wait until they go and get a job. Oh. <laughs> until their grandkids watch that oh, back. Yes. This is what your granddad did back in 2020. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but anyway, I'll, uh, I'll watch that later. Um, <laughs> Stuart, thank you so much. Um, that's been really, really enjoyable. Live long and prosper. Thank you. there we are another episode of the as yet unnamed podcast done thank you so much to Stuart for joining me uh, for an hour or so for a really good interesting chat um, really really enjoyed it if you want to find out uh, more about Stuart and follow him on his social media then on twitter he is at Stuart Hatton jr and on instagram he is mr gay world underscore Stuart Hatton jr all links are in the description and show notes down below
Thank you very much for listening or watching this episode. Don't forget to click on comment, like, share, subscribe, all the usual bits that we ask you to do every time you listen to these things and you get this far into an episode. That's really good. You've got all the way through. Well done. Thank you so much. It's really appreciated. And until next episode and until we meet again, I have been Ian Barstow. This has been the As Yet Unnamed podcast and bye for now. Bye.